If you have a Bible, please turn in your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Amen. Lord, we ask your, in your um, uh, wisdom, uh, in your power to lead uh, through your Spirit, lead our minds, lead our hearts to understand your Word and uh, not only understand it, but receive it. And... Um, we want uh, to make ourselves available for your spirit to transform us, to make us more in your, or according to your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Back to school. Um, that's a sweet sound <laughs> for me. Back to school. For some, uh, it's a very sweet sound. Uh, nice to hear it. For some others, uh, it might be a bit different. Uh, but uh, we, we have to be, and we are. Uh, we are thankful for God, for um, the educational system we have, for these opportunities we have in, uh, in our country here and everywhere, that people, that children especially, they can learn, they can grow and uh, accumulate information and to learn many skills in life and to be helpful. But above all these things, we as human beings, we need something more than that, you see. Education is receiving information, but there is something more than that can, which can help us to be transformed, you see. Information is not transforming us, but the only Word of God is promised to us that will, uh, through the Holy Spirit, can transform us, can change our lives, you see. We are here today, and every Sunday, or all, always when we are together, our hearts and our minds have to be focused on His Word. We uh, uh, started, I started for probably uh, quite a long time ago, I don't know exactly when uh, we started, but we started to speak, I started to speak about church. So church, what is church? And uh, you may recall that we uh, gave an, um, a fair amount of time, we spent a fair amount of time speaking or trying to define what is the nature of church, who we are in Christ, <laughs> what is the nature uh, of us being here. And um, that means that we know who we are, and then when we know who we are, uh, we know how to conduct. And the passage we read this morning, it is uh, a special Actually, it's a fragment from a special letter from Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he tries to help him, tries to encourage him. And in, uh, right in the middle of the letter, he stops and says, Well, I, I want to come to you, but before I come to you, I'm writing these instructions that you, for you to know and to understand how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. You see, church is God's household, which is the church of the living God. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's Christ's church. And we have to be responsible with this attitude that is not my church, that we sometimes we say, wait, what is my church? What is your church? We ask, well, it's not mine as a property. I belong to this church. I belong to this body of Christ. This is God's church. And here, now, the title of our message today, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. The church, the pillar, and foundation of the truth. Well, when we know these things, we are 
now ready to act according to what we know, who we are. And um, I'll try to do something uh, this morning. Uh, I'll try to have a general scan uh, through, uh, you know, of all letter, First Timothy, and probably Second Timothy too. I've seen already some. Um, I browse reason raised a bit. <laughs> it's quite difficult. Yes, I know, but. We, we are not rushing through. If we don't have time, sufficient time today, there's plenty other time we can look into. The, uh, the goal of this letter, the goal of Paul uh, in this letter was one of those, uh, let's say, um, it was so serious. <laughs> he wasn't only writing to encourage him. He writes to Timothy because there was a huge problem in that church where he left Timothy and that church supposed to be God's church and to keep the truth and to act according to the truth. And uh, we find in chapter 1, look with me in chapter 1, if you have your Bible opened and as our uh, uh, beloved brother Eddie said, they open, an open Bible is valuable more than two others on a shelf, closed. So if you have it open now, look with me in chapter 1. And chapter 1, uh, right through in verse 3, Paul says, As I urged you when I went in Macedonia, stay here in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. You see, that was his reason for Timothy to stay there. And just imagine a, a, young, a young person, a young minister, staying there in front of a church with many teachers. They claim to be teachers. They claim to know things. And he is telling to this Timothy, Timothy, though you are young, don't be afraid. You have to be there and to command certain people in that church not to teach false doctrines any longer. You see, it's not in your, in your authority. It's not in my authority. It's in God's authority. Because the church, the church is called to be the church of God, of living God, and it's a pillar of truth. And we are the foundation of the truth. You see, how... How we as human beings long for the truth. <laughs> we are told many lies in this world and we, we fed up with this, all these lies. Though they are so nice, you know, covered, packed and gave, uh, given to us. But we want the truth. This is our heart. This is your heart. We, want, we, we long for the truth. We want to hear the truth. Because the truth, though sometimes it hurts us, it heals us. You see, the truth and the truth uh, which we find in the Bible, the truth from God, is that truth which leads us into the purpose of Him. And His purpose for me, for you, is His plan to make ourselves according to His image. That was the reason I was created, you was created. We were created for His glory. And uh, you may remember that saying of St. Augustine, you know, that uh, father of church in, in the first or second uh, century. Uh, uh, he told that our hearts, in our hearts, is like, you know, that there is a, an, a, a, a shape and it's, it's empty. And we will not be satisfied. You will not be satisfied until that shape or that uh, emptiness will be filled with God's presence, with Him. Because that's, this is why we were created. To meet, to know God, to know Him, to know the truth, and to know where we are going to. To know what is our origin, why we are here, and to know where we are going to. You see, it's so important to know that. And <laughs> Timothy, you are there with this purpose to tell people. To command to those who are, uh, uh, they pretend they are teachers, and uh, you need to tell them uh, to stop. You need to tell them to stop. You see, it, this is such a, a strong, <laughs> it's a strong 
um, uh, word to tell someone, just imagine being us being here <laughs> and uh, someone preaching here and telling things which are not completely are not in agreement with what God would like to hear from us, from a preacher, from a minister, and someone to stand up and say, you have to stop. And everybody to look, you know, that would be uh, the most embarrassing moment. But <laughs> imagine Timothy had to do that, to tell those people to stop. Because this is so important. The message we got, the message we have, it's so important. And we have to keep the truth. Why the truth? Well, many times when we hear the truth, we say, well, the truth has to do with doctrines. This is how Paul says here, actually, command them not to teach false doctrines. Well, when we hear about doctrines, <laughs> we, we think about something which is related more with our, you know, reasoning with our uh, uh, mind, with our uh, intellectual faculties, with, with anything which has to do with our capacity to learn things, you see. It's nothing to do with, uh, with uh, our life, quotidian, you know, everything we, we experience every day in, uh, on our routine life. So it's nothing to do with Monday, Tuesday, and so on. And unfortunately, in church, we sometimes are tempted to think that everything which has to do with the Word of God and with encouraging in the Word of God has to do mostly with the Sunday morning. But Monday, Tuesday, up to Saturday, Sunday, it's up to us how we live. No, Paul says actually through this letter that everything a church does, everything we do has to be uh, uh, has to have this foundation on the truth. And this truth affects actually everything. And if you read through Timothy, and I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, read already, you went through First Timothy, you would find that it affects actually all categories of people and all areas of life. The truth, the church as a pillar of truth, and the foundation of truth, <laughs> it has to affect. It has many, many links with your life in every moment, every minute. I was uh, discussing with someone a few days ago, and I was, we well, were, no, discussing and had some quite different opinions on a matter. And at one point, the other one was bothered by the fact that, you know, why, am, why do you speak to me this way? <laughs> you know, I, I know what you say. Well, I know that the church and then the church thinks. And, but let's leave now the faith aside for a moment. We are, don't speak about these churchy things now. <laughs> well, I said, no, that's, that's false. The churchy things, the faith things, actually has to affect your life entirely. Every second of your life, you have to think through these lenses that you believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus, you know the truth. Knowing the truth, you have to walk according the, to the truth. So you have to apply everything you know about Jesus, everything you know about the truth, everything you know about God, everything you know about his plan, about his purpose, you have to apply in each of your segment of, of your life. Everything had to be affected by that. And look, chapter 1, we find here teachers or so-called teachers. You see, it affects actually all categories of people, including teachers. We are given such a great responsibility to when we teach what we teach. And that's why we appreciate so much our teachers in church, especially if we were speaking about children. They... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me that our teachers in church, for our children, they are having the same value, if not more, than any other teacher in school. Because they would teach them things from the Bible, but the most important, how to know God, how to discern things, you see. And then chapter 1, teachers, chapter 2, it affects men and women, you remember? When uh, Paul is saying that 
when, when we pray and men have to raise their hands to be clean hands, and then about women, how to dress in church, and, and then it speaks about um, all people. Pray for uh, kings, pray for any. So all, all people, everybody are included in here in, relate, in relation with the truth. Also in chapter 3, he speaks in church about deacons, elders, positions, or roles. Let me say roles, it's more <laughs> appropriate. Roles, yeah? Children, then. Families. It affects all these categories. Chapter 5, he encouraged Timothy to have a, a, a wisdom in his relationship with old men, younger men, older women, younger women, widows, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren. Everybody here are included, you see, in chapter 6. It affects even slaves and masters. Well, probably we don't have, <laughs> unless it's uh, a very bad thing in, in this country at the moment to find such a thing, slaves and masters. But in those times, slavery was different than what we know today, probably, or we've been taught today. Let's, let's translate it today in our modern <laughs> days. Nowadays, employers and employees. <laughs> How this should affect your relationship as an employer or as an employee, you see? Everything has to do, the, the, the truth has to, has to do with everything in your life, with all these categories of people. And then it affects all areas in life. Look in chapter 1. As I said, there were teachers and it affects our learning, how we learn. Well, when we speak about teaching and learning, we have, or we are encouraged to have a double, um, to spend, or to be, you know, double care, or be careful, <laughs> double careful, <laughs> be very serious with what you hear, to discern, yeah? Um, these teachers, if you have your Bible open to, uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 7, these teachers, they want to be teachers of the law, but listen, they do not know what they are talking about. This is how they are described here. They are not real teachers, and they do not know what they are talking about. You know, they are using the law, and verse 8 says, we know that the law is good if one use it, uses it properly. That means some people used it in an improper way. Some people use the Bible. They use the Word of God in an improper way. They don't know about what they are talking about. They are just using scriptures just to justify their desires, put them together, and make a nice presented lesson or a a conference, or whatever you want, use it in a selfish or in a different way which the Word of God actually was given as a purpose to change our lives, you see, to glorify Him. And this Word of God says in chapter 1, verse uh, 10, it says it's, it's uh, all this, what they did was contrary to the sound doctrine which conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. You see, that's the meaning, and that's the purpose of the God, the God's Word. Ultimately, to bring Him glory, not me. It doesn't matter who speaks here. It doesn't matter who I am as position or role. It's so important that the word spoken here to be from God and to be for his glory. That's, that's how it's, it is about how it affects teaching and learning. Everything we learn, we need to filter. We need to think about it and to compare and to take it through this filter, which is the scripture, the word of God. And it helps us. We have to know. We have to know it very well. And then, chapter 2. It affects prayer, worship, and even 
wearing clothes. <laughs> it affects in that area too. Look in chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> I urge then, first of all, that uh, requests, uh, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, to pray for everyone. And now, look here. Kings, authorities, that we may live in uh, peaceful and quiet lives and in all godliness and holiness. But this is good. Why? Because it pleases God, our Savior. And now, here is the reason, the reason. Who wants all people to be what? Saved. And to come to a knowledge of the truth. It doesn't say that it's God's God wants all people to be healed. <laughs> it didn't happen in Paul's days. Even Paul wasn't healed. Well, we empathize with people, and we are called to empathize and, and pray and be there. But sometimes my impression is that we are empathizing a bit more than God <laughs> in, in what people are experiencing. And he, why, why, what if God actually allowed some things in someone's life, to help him, to direct his eyes from that situation, from that uh, problem, and help him to meet God. And we are praying for all his bruises and scratches and everything, and we forget about his salvation. Ultimately, when we pray for someone, we need to understand that the truth of God has to do with his salvation. And that's the ultimate and the, the, the greatest gift someone can receive in this life, eternal life. For there is one God and mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people, says verse 5. What do we hear here? What is this? The gospel. And probably, let's stop and imagine a bit, you know, Timothy, having this letter, reading it, coming here and says, him to stop and say, well, I don't know why, <laughs> why he's, is he repeating this to me? He told that when I was a kid. He told me that when, when I was in the uh, Bible class there. He told that in private. He told me that, and now he's writing it again and again and again and again. I know the story. Well, that's not the point that you know the story. Well, we, we, we all know the story. We all know the details of the story. The problem is not that we don't know it. We need to stick with it, with a meaning. And to remember that everything, even our prayers, have to be shaped in this gospel perspective. There is God. There is humankind. And between, in between, there is Christ. And Christ, Jesus, gave himself as a ransom for all people, for me, for you. Don't forget that. And um, for this purpose, he reminds even Paul, him. He was appointed a herald and an apostle. And I am telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And the true and the faithful teacher of the Gentiles. You see how many times he's repeating that. He's bringing here true truth. We need to hear that. We need to be encouraged and be ready to spend as much as we need time in God's word to know it. And then he goes on and he says uh, chapter 2 verse 8 and he goes to a in a particular in another area, particular area, uh, telling man to pray in a special way. <laughs> it was a custom probably, you know, raising hands. But it also was a, a, a saying, you know, when, when we say about having clean, ha uh, clean hands, that means we are spotless, you know. You can't pray and holding in your heart sin. You know that you sinned against God, and you don't want to solve that issue. You don't want to bring it. But you come and pray loudly and uh, in an artistic way. Everybody to, to look at, you know, at me and how, how loud and how spiritual I am praying 
for everybody, for kings, for authorities, for those who need and leaving aside my sin, hiding it in my heart. Well, that's not a worship. We're not coming here to worship, to feel good, <laughs> though we are not feeling good. We are here to meet him and let him work in my life. Let him work in your life, in my life too. But with uh, the ladies here, he also addressed this uh, uh, issue of uh, modesty, dressing, how we dress. Is the truth affecting even this area in my life? Oh, yes, it affects it. It's not giving here what kind of dress we should wear. It's not about, uh, you know, uh, short, long um, colors and everything. No, it's about, again, about the heart issue. What it means to be modest? Not to draw the attention upon yourself. When you are here, you're not called to draw the attention upon yourself. We are here as a body of Christ to lift up his name and his name, only his name be praised. Not my name. I've been embarrassed to hear my name so many times. <laughs> well, it's not about myself, it's about him. And then, and then he goes on. Chapter 3. It's speaking about homes. You see how many areas in your home? How is your house? How is your home? How is your household? How is your family? We ask time to time, well, when we meet someone, how are you? How is your family? Doing? Well, politely we can give a short answer. Well, we are fine, thank you. <laughs> we are fine. I'm okay. I'm not sure if okay here means lower than fine. <laughs> you know, and we have all kinds of uh, expressions to to give a hint, you know, where we are. And it uh, depends on the relationship on, on, and how much you are, uh, you know, want to discuss about that thing, about your issues. But to be honest, <laughs> we always have something. We always have something to discuss about our families. There are always things we need to bring them back, put them in the right way. If there is anyone here who didn't have any other opinion with his wife or his, or his husband, <laughs> I would like to know him. <laughs> I don't know how, but we manage, we manage almost every day to have some different opinions in different matters. And uh, what I realize is just <laughs> my heart is like this. Sometimes I don't like, you know to be told what to do. And that's again, a matter of heart. You see, how is your family managing your home, raising children, about children? Well, I, I couldn't, I, I didn't know that I am so severe at some points until I had my children. And I, I am so impatient until God sent me children. And he said, well, you didn't learn your lesson. Here's another one, and another one, and another one. He keeps sending hope. By the end, I will learn something. Patience. Um, chapter 4. If you are following with me, chapter 4. I'll be finished in a moment. Don't worry. Chapter 4. Now... <clears throat> Somewhere at the end, uh, he says, Command and teach these things. And what are those things? Well, point these things out to the brothers and sisters. You appointing them, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Verse 6, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. You see? You're nourished on the truths of the faith if you're doing that. And then, verse 11, command and teach these things. Command again. Now, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, 
but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. <laughs> well, if I would be Timothy, I would write back <laughs> to, to Paul. I would say, Paul, I think this section, uh, you missed the destination. You should write this to the Ephesians, <laughs> not to me. Well, what, what does it have to do with me, you know? Do not let anyone look down on you. Well, that means you have to walk with dignity. Well, we, have, we, we always will be criticizing one, you know, one area or other in, in, in our life. But when Paul writes this to Timothy, he says, don't give any occasion or people to say something bad about you because you have to set an example you have to set an example working in, with dignity and again self-discipline well self-discipline watch your life and doctrine closely verse 15 be diligent in these matters give yourself wholly uh, to them so that everyone may see your progress are you following your progress i'm afraid Many times, I'm just hiding behind him. Well, I'm too busy, I'm having this and that, and I don't have time to look into my progress. I'm taking as it is. No, you have to spend time looking into your heart and be diligent with this matter, especially with your life and doctrine closely. Why? Because what do you know? What do you know that feeds your actions? And then persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Such a great responsibility. And then chapter 5, helping those in need. Some widows. That was an, you know, uh, an issue related with widows in, in that church. And Paul had to address that. How to help those in need? Well, of course, we have to, to reason and to, to, be, to be very careful Sometimes, in desire to help someone, we do something which is not helpful at all. <laughs> we, we may have a good heart, but if we don't have a, a, we, a, a wise attitude with the resources we have, we may actually not helping people, but giving giving them an opportunity to destroy themselves. So we are called to help. And when we say help, it doesn't mean always <laughs> to give something yeah, to someone. Um, <clears throat> and then um, sixth, the sixth chapter from First Timothy. And this one is very interesting. It has to do with something called we... We love to hear money, <laughs> money, even with your money, with my money. What has the truth to do with my money? What has the sermon in church or the teachings or the Bible to say about money? Well, there's a lot about money. <laughs> it's not because, you know, we need how to be uh, uh, trained to do more money <laughs> and uh, some people, and I'll, I'll bring it actually a bit later, some will use anything, even taking holy things and making money. Because their desire is how to get more, get more. So we are here to be diligent with our money as well. But here is the point, and uh, uh, Paul, he's not at all interested on, on how we <laughs> are doing money, well, not in the way that we should be, uh, you know, we, we should uh, earn our money uh, in a very, in a correct way, and then, uh, but it's, it's about, he's not uh, concerned about how money we can get. He's so concerned here about the money, how the love of money can affect and destroy us. Um, Look in uh, verse 3, chapter 6. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. 
insistence. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have and an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind. Now, corruption. We have been robbed of the truth, and who have been robbed of the truth, and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain financial gain. If you think that prosperity gospel <laughs> it's a, a relative new idea now. It was a, it was right from the beginning. Some people they knew how to manipulate, <laughs> how to bring all kind of words, to use them in a uh, with a purpose and to gain something from that gain something from that. Of course, uh, Paul has to write here and, and to give the right attitude toward those who are serving in church and how to support them. But some people are using all these things in a manner, an ungodly manner, and using godly things to dishonor him and to gain something for them. And it's so, it's so sad to see even today people giving their lost money for someone who is so rich but can speak in a such a manner that they would give everything they have for the cause of such a cold kingdom. But we don't know whose kingdom is that. You see, we are called to manage wisely our money, our money, and also to manage wisely the truth when we speak the truth, when we preach the gospel, we preach it for free. <laughs> we don't want people, you know, somehow to be involved with money things there, with love of money there. We preach the gospel in the name of Christ, regarding Christ, for Christ, for his glory. And God takes care in church for those who are preaching in this way. But we are called to be so careful how we handle. Now, you may say, well, who is this Timothy? You spoke about Timothy. Well, he was a young minister, yeah. I think this sermon had to do with those who are preaching and uh, serving now. Otherwise, why would have your Bible, Timothy, First and Second Timothy there? If God would send these teachings only for ministers, probably we, have, we had to have two Bibles. <laughs> one for ministers and one for the others in church. You see how we can put the things, but it's not right. We all are part of the same body. We all are called to hear, to receive, to apply, and let God's truth affect all these areas. Let's pray. Lord, we heard again and we are exposed again to your truth. It's so, it's so important to know it and help us, Lord. You gave us all the abilities to understand your word. And um, in your mercy, you revealed yourself in such a manner that even children can understand plan of salvation, the plan you have with every one of us. And if you have given to us more than others, Lord, there is only one purpose, to get deeper and deeper and know it better and be transformed and pass it on to others. Lord, help our church to be the church of a true pillar a pillar of the truth and a foundation of the truth. Amen.